Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Mr. Tony Tan Kak Tiong. Secretary Gregory Domingo of the uh, Department of Trade and Industry of the Philippines. Under Secretary Laura Del Rosario of the Department of Foreign Affairs, government officials, officials of the APEC Business Advisory Council, APEC members, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial students and guests, good afternoon to you all. Thank you for uh, inviting me here today. You know, I was once a student like many of you here today. I graduated from the University of Santo Tomas in Manila a long time ago with a degree in chemical engineering. But when it comes to entrepreneurship, the only place I can say I graduated from is the School of Hard Knocks. And I must confess, I'm still earning my degree in Hard Knocks as I speak today. The theme of our conference is about breaking barriers through innovation. I believe the real key to breaking barriers starts right here in our own minds. What we carry in our heads, our mindsets. Let me start out by giving you a couple examples of what mindsets have been able to accomplish. So how many of you here know who this man is? Not that many or almost nobody. He's a Filipino. In 1995, he was working as a lifeguard at a hotel resort in Cebu in the southern Philippines. Soon, he was promoted to become the hotel's sports and recreation coordinator. A few years later, he decided, of all things, that he wanted to climb the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. In 2004, he joined the newly formed Philippine Mount Everest Expedition Team and embarked on two years of rigorous training, swimming 4,000 meters a day, running 10 kilometers three times a week, and biking four hours one day a week. Just two years later, on May 17, 2006, Leo Oracion became the first Filipino to reach the summit of Mount Everest. From lifeguard to one of the world's most successful mountain climbers in about 10 years. And to think that Leo comes from a tropical country like the Philippines, a country where it never snows, a country whose average altitude is probably two to three meters above sea level, <laughs> and whose average temperature is 27 degrees centigrade. To think that someone coming from a country like this can succeed in climbing the highest peak on Earth, 8,800 meters high, with cliffs of ice and snow in sub-zero temperature. Our normal mindset says, no way. You have to break your normal way of thinking to believe it. Leo Oracion believed it. He believed he could do it. He trained hard and against all odds, he achieved it. Here's a guy you all know. And speaking of breaking mindsets, who could have imagined that this man would become president of the United States? Born in Hawaii of African-American descent, his father from Kenya, his middle name Hussein, he ran for the U.S. House of Representatives in the year 2000, and he lost. Just eight years later, he ran for the office of the President of the United States, and remarkably, he won. To top it off, just two months ago, he ran again and was re-elected, proving it was no fluke. How many people believe he could do it? Probably not many. Do you think he believed he could do it? You better believe it. 
And finally, here's another man you all know, the president of the Philippines. When he became president, he adopted a key slogan, Kung walang corrupt, walang mahirap. Which means, if there's no corruption, there's no poverty. Against all odds, he's made significant progress on this front. The first president in many years to do so. There are many indicators you can cite as measures of his success in fighting corruption. One simple measure of his effectiveness is the tax collection growth rate of the Bureau of Internal Revenue. Tax revenue in the Philippines is very important because it accounts for two-thirds of the entire revenue of the national government. Tax compliance has historically been very low and many people used to find ways to avoid paying their taxes. And take a look at this slide. In 19, 2009, the, the year before Pinoy was elected president, tax collections by the BIR declined by 4% from the previous year. Not a very promising performance. In 2010, Pinoy's first year in office, tax collections rose by 10%. The following year, they grew by 12%. And most recently, in 2012, they grew an even bigger 14%. That's three years of double-digit growth in tax revenue in a row. Simple numbers, a clear picture. Mindsets have changed. Filipino taxpayers are complying. More and more people believe in Pinoy's program of kung walang corrupt, walang mahirap. Nobody thought this could be done, but Pinoy is doing it. He never doubted he could do it. That's the power of mindset. These are impressive examples of the power that our mindsets possess over ourselves and our future or destiny. They are far better than my story about founding Jollibee, but let me share it with you anyway because mindset has played a key role in our success as well. The story of Jollibee Foods Corporation is a story of finding opportunities amidst difficult times. More than 30 years ago, my family invested in an ice cream franchise. The ice cream house came about because of an advertisement we saw when my wife-to-be, Grace, and I visited the main Magnolia ice cream plant which used to be in San Juan here in Metro Manila. That's part of our school graduation requirement. The advertisement we saw was an invitation for franchises to join Magnolia. I responded to it right away since I saw that the investment was not too big and it was an opportunity that could help me support my future family. Raising the investment money became my first challenge. Fortunately, we were rescued by my late father and my late father-in-law. And here's a picture of my father and mother at that time. We proceeded to open two ice cream houses in Cubao and Quiapo, and they became the forerunners of Jollibee. There were many ice cream hardlers at the time, and they were all selling the same stuff. Our challenge was how to attract customers to our stores we decided to offer extra big scoops of ice cream, provide cleaner stores than others, and super efficient service. Happily, customers flocked to our stores. And way back then, we learned that it pays to give customers more than they expect. When we found out that our customers were craving for something hot, we introduced sandwiches such as hamburgers. And soon enough, the hamburgers were outselling the ice cream. So in 1978, we decided to shift to hamburger as our focus and also to professionalize our management. It was not an easy change as we had to contend with new people and new processes. And suddenly, we learned 
that the biggest multinational hamburger chain in the world was about to enter the Philippine market. Many of my well-intentioned friends advise us to sell out while we still could. Their mindset was, how could a small local Filipino company with only five stores back then take on the leading multinational in a business they had practically invented, the hamburgers? This was a moment of truth for us, a moment that directly tested my hope and my ambition. If I had no hope, I would have sold out the business right then, and I would not be standing here in front of you today. Instead, I might be flipping burgers for you know who. <laughs> Maybe I was naive during those moments, but I believe that we could succeed in the hamburger business, even against the biggest player in the world. I did not make up that belief and I really believed it. For better or worse, that was my mindset. That's because I knew our customers like our hamburgers, they liked their taste, and they kept coming back. My father, who once had owned a restaurant in Davao, always told us that in the restaurant business, it's the taste that counts. That sounds elementary, doesn't it? and very basic, but it's very important. I was convinced that our company could offer better tasting products than our competitors. So we went ahead and we opened up one store at a time, slowly at first. Then when we saw that each store was making money, we opened more. Since then, we never lost our leadership position, and I guess that's because our customers really like our products, especially a new chicken product we added early on called Chicken Joy. I admit, those early days of Jollibee were not easy. We went through lots of challenges. We took plenty of risks, and in taking this risk, there were times we'd lose money due to the mistakes we could make. But throughout these challenges, I continued to have high hopes that anything is possible. I think I picked up this belief from my mom that things are predestined in a certain way and that our role is to do what we can as best as what we can and don't worry about the outcome. The outcome will take care of itself. This belief has kept me sleeping well at night. It has freed me up to take on whatever comes next. It gives me new hope every day. So whenever we face a crisis or an obstacle, I saw it as an opportunity to build new strength. Nothing in my mind held me back, and somehow a solution would always appear. I feel lucky to have this mindset, and somehow I still have it today. During the political crisis of the 80s, when foreign companies shied away from further investing in the Philippines, we felt that it was a good opportunity to invest actively. We plowed back every single centavo of our profits into new Jollibee stores, thus expanding our business and network in the country. We continue to invest, innovate, and grow while seeing similar opportunities in challenging times. In 1997, during the Asian financial crisis, we managed to open 85 new stores, a record high for our company. In the year 2000, when the peso and the local stock market declined and the economy was hardly growing, we acquired Chow King and decided to start constructing what would become the largest company-owned commissary in Asia. In 2008, despite the soaring prices of basic commodities and the onset of global financial crisis, we opened 175 new stores worldwide. Jollibee Foods Corporation also acquired new businesses in China, in Vietnam, and expanded in Asia, the USA.